How many times have we heard Christians and atheists mock Mormonism for believing that mankind can one day become gods? To join the Godhead, the great governing body of the universe. That is a pretty hilarious belief, is it not? The audacity of such a statement. How vain and conceited. Most of you even consider it blasphemy to contemplate such a thing. For you Christians, let me ask you this question. Do you believe that if you are saved and you are resurrected to eternal life, do you believe that you will live forever? If you do believe that, your soul will continue on past this life. Would it be logical to say that there is no end to your life? It stands to reason that you shouldn't have a problem with that statement, that there will be no end to your life. Have any of you ever given any thought as to what you will be doing with yourself for the next forever? What are your thoughts? What do you think you will be doing? Do you think you will be doing nothing? That you will enter into your eternal rest and never do anything ever again? What kind of life is that? Isn't that what the atheists believe? That after you leave this world you won't ever do anything ever again? because you cease to exist? So, if you are a Christian, think about it. What kind of life would eternity be if you never did anything ever again? How many of you who are active and able can sit in a chair for a day and not do anything? Not listen to the TV, nor the radio, nor music, nor read a book. Just sit there. How many of you can do it for five minutes without wanting to go and do something? Even just to talk. Why does the Bible encourage us to work? Why does it tell us to earn our bread by the sweat of our brow? Why does it tell us to not be idle? Why does Paul tell us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? The truth is that most people are simply not happy unless they can be active in some way, engaged in a purpose, engaged in a cause. How many of you take joy in building miniature landscapes for your model trains? How many of you enjoy restoring an old car? How many of you enjoy decorating your homes with flowers and pictures and crafts of all kinds? Would you be happy if you had to stop doing all those things if you lived forever? To enter into your eternal rest and do absolutely nothing forever and ever and just sit there. Would that be true happiness? Well, hopefully most of you would say, of course not. Most of you would say that would be a fate worse than death. Okay, so if you are willing to accept the fact that you take joy in your work and hobbies, in sprucing up your home and making it better, that you take joy in helping others, then would you be willing to accept that if you live forever, you will also want to be doing things forever? And if you are willing to accept that, then would it be acceptable to play a game of logic and put it all together? That if you take joy in doing things throughout your life, and you will want to continue doing things in your eternal life, so you don't get bored and go stir-crazy. Then wouldn't it be logical to say that if there is no end to your life, there is also no end to your works? Are you willing to accept that? If there is no end to your life, then there is also no end to your works. If you can't accept that natural reality, then why not? Can any of you Christians answer that? Maybe you would be more content to join your atheist friends. That when we leave this life, we cease to exist. Blind random chance, of course. And here we are. The greatest minds in the world with unlimited resources have yet to engineer a machine with all the capabilities that a human body has. Yet we all just somehow appeared here anyway, by blind random chance. Everything in the universe exploded into existence by accident in a very big bang.
Well, good for you, atheist. You keep thinking and dreaming that stuff up and have a good day. Now back to you Christians. If you are by chance open-minded enough to accept that if there is no end to your eternal life and there is no end to your eternal works, then what do you imagine it means to say there is no end to your works? Do you believe in the saying that knowledge is power? Then if there is no end to your works, is it not reasonable to say that there will be no end to your accumulation of knowledge? And if there is no end to your knowledge, what do you think you can accomplish by your endless works? What are the endless possibilities of endless works and knowledge? I know you Christians say that is blasphemy because that replaces God. But why do you think that? Why do you think that God would place the mechanism of the universe beyond his control? Wouldn't it again be more reasonable and logical to believe that instead of replacing God, as you have accused, that we will be forever subject to God, and that through our endless works we glorify God? And as one earth shall pass away, and the heavens thereof, even so shall another come, and there is no end to my works, neither to my words. For behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. It says God's glory is to bring to life the immortality and eternal life of man. Does that make sense? And how could one who thus possesses a will, which is forever independent of his Creator, be measured for the vast responsibilities of an endless future, except by his record? For how could the government of the heavens be upheld in everlasting security, except the powers thereof be conferred upon those who have demonstrated that the will of the Father is superior to death, or to the multiplied sacrifices of life? And how could the hosts of the righteous who people the celestial worlds abide forever in his presence if they could not live obedient under celestial law? Wherefore, according to the record, which record is kept in heaven, and it is the record of the deeds done in the body, and this includeth the works of repentance, even according to the record, shall it be with every man to receive much or little, and thus man shapeth his own destiny, even as God, in whose likeness he is made, even in the likeness of his spirit and in the image of his body. And behold, the Redeemer is the Son of God, even his express image, and the hair of all things which the Father hath created and made. And behold, if you will turn your face unto the heavens and look into the bosom of the immeasurable expanse, were countless worlds like unto this move in trains of never-ending glory. Before the vision of the eye, you will behold the heritage of the Son. And unto his redeemed, he will deliver the title deeds of their eternal estates. For all the fullness of the Father's kingdoms are the heritage of the righteous. And their birthright of free agency abideth in them forever as in the Son. And to this end, even that man might inherit all things, Jesus Christ came into the world to suffer for them and be lifted up before them, that they might see him suffer, and thus seeing him suffer, might know of the fullness of the measure of his love for them. Yea, that they might marvel and be astonished. For he unto whom was given the cup of gall in his cry of thirst suffered greater extremes than any man, and drank deeper of the cup of bitterness which the Father had prepared for him, that his Son might show forth the depths of their infinite love and be exalted to sit at the right hand of eternal power. And if the sacrifices and the pains which he suffered, both of body and of mind, like unto which no man could suffer, behold, I say unto you, 
that if so great a love for men cannot prevail upon them to acknowledge their Creator and walk in obedience to His wishes. There is no power in the heavens or upon the earth that can save them that are thus created in the likeness of God. For omnipotence did truly exhaust the possibilities of the natural world, that the children of men might be persuaded to love Jesus Christ, and believe Him to be the only begotten of the Father, sent into the world for their redemption and exaltation. <laughs> 